Um, I've got some info on trade-ins and what does what is clean versus rough book mean. Uh, yeah. A lot of people think their bikes are worth more than they are. Everybody oh. wants their stuff to be more valuable. So mm-hmm. um, there's some guidelines out there that um, really lay out what clean means. And generally, like that bike is clean because it has all of the stuff, all the service records, all you know, everything. When mm. um, people that ride their motorcycle for a while and if you don't have like brand new tires and you got one or two scratches on it it's not clean already yeah yeah uh the other thing i'll add is like if you're talking or when you're talking sometimes i'm just glancing at battery power or checking something just keep talking keep looking at you yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) because i'm just like oh is that still yeah okay it's good yeah we're recording cool cool okay all right on everything's on you ready to get started yeah let's do it all right man give it a shot knock it out all right, everybody, welcome to the show. We've got Chance Williams. I'm super excited to uh, do this episode, Chance, have you here. I actually pitched you my idea, and you were like, let's do it. And I'm like, dude, he's all in. In the um, aspect, is the aspect right? Of transparency, I think, being authentic, transparent, because you are a, a general manager of Foothills BMW. And so, first of all, welcome to the show, man. Good to be here. Thank you. It's my first podcast, so let's do it. All right, it's mine, too. So uh, we'll do it together. We'll figure it out. I actually picked up these microphones at Walmart on the way here. So (laughs) we're, uh, yeah, so back to it, transparency, authenticity, vulnerability. That's what people want, right? And I think the, or I know the impression is, if you go to any Facebook page or any forum, that the second you walk into an establishment like yours, uh, you just better bend over because here it comes. And I appreciate you being willing to come on the show and to talk about kind of pulling the curtain back uh, as a general manager of a, of a dealership and letting people see sort of behind the curtain and, and kind of see what goes into running a dealership because ultimately it's a massive business, right? And you've got margins you got to make and you got salaries you got to pay and you got Im- inventory you got to keep. And uh, I think the idea is that w- when people walk in here, you shouldn't be doing any of that. And I got to say right off the front, like, I'm not here. Like, you guys didn't uh, compensate me to be here to make this a big commercial for Foothills. I just... Oh, you came after me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just, uh, you know, I see it all. You see it. How many bikes you got on the floor here? Uh, about 150. 150. Yep. Right? So a, a big business to run. You got how many, you know, thousands of dollars in tools in the back, I would assume? Tens and tens of thousands of dollars of tools. I've got hundreds of thousands of dollars of apparel and parts. Um, I've got a staff of 18 that I've got to keep paid. So. Right, right. So... As anybody that's running a business, I think uh, the ultimate goal sounds a little, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Might be a little chafing, but the ultimate goal is for you to make money. Like, why are you here other than to make money? Yeah, we talked about transparency. It's a for-profit business. Yeah. We're here to make money. Um, I'm in a unique position where I get to reinvest some of that money back into the dealership, though. I get to, uh, my goal is to keep the staff around and pay them a little bit more in the long run. Um, that only helps the client at the end of the day when I've got knowledgeable people here, uh, improve the facilities, um, stuff like that. So it doesn't just all go into my pocket or the owner's pocket. Um, we do a lot to put it back into the business and improve ourselves. And I might be gil- be getting a little bit ahead of myself, but man, if you're one of those folks, uh, and I've dabbled a little bit in it, but you want to do your own service and you want to sell or buy bikes, uh, you know, person to person, then by all means. But if you want to do business at a for-profit institution, then there are things, and I'm going to get to it right here. Uh, this is the 2024 uh, R1300 GS. What is this actually called? What is this document called? This is called a Monroney label. Okay, so this is the label. This is every every time you go to a car dealership, every time you go to a bike show, it's got everything here. And I'm not going to read it all, but you got the MSRP. Then you get all the, the, the type of trim, you know, and everything. And all the way to the bottom line, total suggested retail price. $28,130 and then uh, some safety features, VIN number and all that stuff. So talk a little bit about, let's start by talking about this. Cause so my initial question was going to be $28,130. How much are you making? How much are, are you charging to, you know, get your margins? But I think we need to go beyond that and, and actually give folks a little bit of education as you were doing before we started the show on this actual document and what it means. So if you want to start with that. Yeah, let's start with MSRP because um, I want to go to the top line of that yes. document, which is how many how many dollars? It's uh, eighteen thousand eight hundred ninety five dollars. Manufacturers manufacturers suggested retail base price. So the manufacturers are going to compete against each other to create the best product at a competitive price and get 
uh, just like any marketing or advertising, get all of the eyes on them and their product. Okay. So when you have the new 2024 20, uh, 20, uh, 1300 GS that starts at 18,000 something dollars, um, that's the base price. So that's, that's BMW um, showing you what their product uh, can cost at a low price point. Uh, 19 grand for a motorcycle is, is pretty reasonable of that caliber. Um, once you get into all the options though, that's where BMW really shines with automatic ride height and electronic suspension and all their ride modes. Um, that's the stuff you really buy a BMW for. Okay. So that ends up at the bottom line there at $28,000 um, by the time you get to all those options. So, so and I want to come at you from a perspective of a consumer, right? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I, I obviously understand you have to run a business, but I've never run a motorcycle business, right? So when, when a modern consumer comes in, or maybe since the beginning of time, and they see total suggested retail price, uh, $20,130. I want to say, hey, I want this motorcycle. Could you do 25000 Is that feasible or not feasible? And, and I'm just saying 25000 because it's like three grand less, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I had that much money in a motorcycle. Okay. Uh, if I could make that much money and make that deal for you, um, we would we would be in a much bigger, nicer facility if there was that much mm. profit rolling around. Interesting. So the next question would be if, if well, the first question would be, are the prices locked in? In other words, as uh, everybody that buys that 1300 through your door, is everybody going to pay the exact same price? I mean, obviously financing rates could change and all that, but I'm talking like the price of the bike. Is it the same for everybody? Yes. They're all going to pay the bottom line price there, um, plus a, a handful of other things that are uh, necessary for every bike purchase. Um, that's my my not so elegant answer. Not so elegant answer. So, you know, I was going to ask uh, Brendan this, your sales manager. So if the price, and, and I don't want to put you on the spot too much here, but we are getting behind the scenes. If the price of the bike does not, I don't say isn't negotiable, but if it's, if it is the price outside of, you know, what County you live in and the taxes you pay, then why the need for sales managers and extra sales staffs, people to walk people through the process. It's like, look, the price is the price, man. Why can't you do a, um, a model? Like I don't want to say Carvana, but it's basically like you got one dude and everybody's paying the same thing. Why do you need that staff? Are you excited when you walk into a CarMax or a Carvana? Well, I haven't walked into one, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not very exciting. That's the automotive world is a is a need. It's not a want. So mm -hmm. you need a car. You're going to go shop around. You're going to try and find the best price on a car, a car that fits your needs. That's not the motorcycle world at all. Um, all of my staff. Why do I need a sales manager and a parts counter and salespeople? Is to create the experience that goes with motorcycling. Uh, you're, I, the goal is to not be here just to give you this product. Okay. Um, I share the whole lifestyle around it. All of my staff, every single one of us has multiple motorcycles and we all ride. We all share in that. Um, we want to share that experience with all of our clients. When somebody walks through the door, they might be a seasoned motorcycle rider. They might have seen a motorcycle on TV and they want to get into it. Um, our goal is to take those two very different people and still by the end of the, the sales experience, um, have them excited to go out and ride. When I think back to my purchases and I my interactions at say motorcycle, because I hate buying cars. It's everybody the hates it's, buying cars. It's the worst. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. it's the worst. Um, but with motorcycles, you do feel like because if you go to a car dealership, oh, you drive a car too. Oh, cool, man. We all drive cars. Like yeah, whatever. Um, but with motorcycle dealers, you do find a, a fellow enthusiast, right? And they can talk you through things. So. I was gonna talk about a gas station and gas prices, and you'll see where I'm going here in a second. So I've heard that although gas is the most expensive thing you buy at a gas station, the money's made on the inside, retail, right? All the stuff they sell on the inside. So the percept, or not the perception, the reality is these motorcycles are the, the most expensive thing that someone can purchase here. Now you've got kind of your three-legged stool of motorcycle retail, parts, and service. Would I be correct to assume that you're probably, when you're looking at your overall margins to support your rent and all the things, that motorcycles might not be the thing that does that for you? That is why everybody pays the same price. Uh, and that, that's why that MSRP exists and why I don't necessarily discount motorcycles. Uh, there's not a lot of money there. And so you're exactly right that the motorcycle is, even though it's the most expensive piece in the dealership, mm -hmm. it's not where the money is made. Uh, the money is made in us creating a relationship with you right. so uh, and giving you a place 
to, for all of your motorcycle needs. You get the bike here, but when you come back for service and I can keep it in, in great shape, I've got a whole apparel department over there. We can keep you geared up, uh, riding comfortably and safely, uh, accessorizing the motorcycle, um, all of that stuff, that's where all the money's made. Mm -hmm. uh, my goal is not to sell you one motorcycle. My goal is to have you coming back and sharing this experience and, and buying many motorcycles in a lot of different mediums. So would you think that, you know, people call it a, or refer to it as a stealership? Maybe they don't under, understand that. And, you know, people are entitled to their own opinions. Um, and I want to get into, you kind of dovetail into service and parts. They don't understand how that works or they don't want to understand, right? I love the term stealership and I love hearing my clients say stealership because that is my opportunity to change their mind. I know hmm. why they come in the door. They think that we're a stealership because they're used to the automotive world. They're used to walking into a, a car dealership and dealing with slimy salespeople. And I now get the opportunity to show them that's not how a motorcycle dealership works. And generally by the time they leave, uh, they're excited to come back and they haven't felt that, uh, that bad experience at my store. So when we talk about, uh, that's interesting that you're excited to hear that because uh, it gives you an opportunity, I guess, uh, you know, to prove them wrong, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I, I would assume that there are folks that come in that you probably just, you know, just like any other uh, retail establishment that you just can't make a, a deal with. And I do want to get to parts, but th this one is big because it, it, uh, I've seen it a lot. Does it matter when somebody comes in and says, I've got cash? Does it matter? Um, not necessarily. No. Okay. Why is that? In the world of, of credit and financing today, I can get anybody a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. If you've got cash, that's great. That means generally that means you're here to buy. You're saying that you've got cash. I can walk into somewhere um, with an 800 credit score and kind of say the same thing because I, I, I know that I can go buy something. Um, so when a client says that to me, um, it just means that they're here ready for me to sell them something or to show them why they need the next cool thing. Yeah, because I think the perception is, well, if I walk in with, a, these days, a suitcase of cash, like 20 grand would fit probably in like a, I don't know, a clutch. <laughs> I don't know. How do I know that's called a clutch? Um, but yeah, so it, it, it doesn't really matter, I guess, right? Because I think the perception is if I walk in with $25,000 and $100 bills, you're going to be like, oh, $28,000? No, for you, Phil, it is now you know, $24,000 probably doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. And to, to get into the nitty gritty behind the scenes a little bit, a dealership makes more money when you finance a motorcycle. Okay. There's advantages for you as a, as the client financing a motorcycle. If you have 25 K cash in a briefcase, uh, it, you know, it's, it's nice to have that liquid and be able to spend that on either an emergency or a new vac a vacation, something else, um, rather than blowing it all on a motorcycle. When you can finance a motorcycle, um, which in the grand scheme doesn't cost you very much money uh, and keep that cash liquid. So talk about that workflow a little bit. So the workflow for cars is once you get past, I got to talk to my manager and you settle on a deal, whatever it is, the, what do they use? Uh, you probably know like the four square thing. And yep. the, yeah. So, and then you go into the finance office and now it's like, here we go again, because they're going to try to sell you all the things, right? Extended warranties and this and that, and the, you know, all the stuff. It's, it's almost a, um, a planned other way to take more money out of your pocket. How, what is that workflow here like in a motorcycle? Does it differ from cars or is it, or is it similar? It's definitely different from cars for a couple of reasons. One, the products that a finance office would sell uh, are not the most advantageous or beneficial for cars, but they can be in motorcycles. The amount of maintenance a motorcycle takes compared to a car is, is very different. So there's opportunities in the finance office uh, to, to get products that actually benefit our clients. Uh, and that's why I have fun as a GM uh, structuring this whole thing because the products that we sell, uh, I, I make sure that they actually benefit our clients. There's nothing I have. I won't let my finance guy sell anything that isn't really going to benefit somebody. Paint protection plan. <laughs> I don't do paint protection. <laughs> I think it's a car dealership. $1,000. Yeah. Like, dude, you didn't yeah. do anything. The undercoating or the, the floor mats. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I enjoy uh, this time shitting on car dealerships. Uh, it's, it's fun to me because it's just such a miserable, miserable experience. So you talk about as a GM, I do this. How much uh, latitude do you have? So I'm, I'm assuming the owners are like, you know, here's, what, here's your goals every quarter, whatever it is. How much latitude do you have? Obviously not with something like this, but... 
in the in the workflow in the process what you allow your people the flexibility to do or not do the finance team there we have a lot of flexibility and a lot of latitude which is a great experience for me uh because my my owners give me a couple guidelines and uh, guardrails if you will here's the goal here's what you can do and what you can't do uh figure it out it's it's up to me to figure out how exactly we get there um so i try and forward that same uh, structure onto my staff as well, um, and let them uh, develop their relations, relationships with their client and figure out the products and how they want to sell something. Um, I, I give them boundaries um, in the parts and service world too. Um, you know, it, it costs me a lot of money for a client to not come back to me. Mm. So they have certain parameters of discounts they can give or um, a goodwill budget, if you will, uh, to make sure that our clients leave here happy. I want to say that it, I want to talk about that that style of leadership real quick, but I think before we get dig into that, everybody wants a deal, right? Doesn't matter if it's a little deal, a lar- everybody wants a large deal, right? So I think that that's a great strategy of uh, maybe I take my bike in and uh, it's three hundred dollars for the oil change, whatever it is, and you're like, hey, because you're a loyal customer, we're going to give you ten fifteen percent off. Like you're still making your money, but I think you, is that part of it? Like you know the percent. You're not handing out coupons everywhere, but it's the perception of like, we we're, we value your service. I would rather give you 10, 15% off now and have you come back three or four more times than maybe not do that and see you later. Yeah, the, the discount thing is there to kind of amend something that we've screwed up. Okay. Um, if everybody wants to get a good deal, but a good deal is ambiguous. What mm. What is a good deal? Exactly. Uh, to some people, that's a, a couple dollars off because they want to come in here and get a couple bucks off and not come back here. Uh, a good deal, you can pay over MSRP and walk out of here feeling like you got a good deal because of the experience that we provide you and uh, the convenience factor as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm selling BMW and Triumph, so I'm selling premium brands. A lot of times the uh, convenience factor is a good deal. So there's some structure that we have here where um, it's, it's, it becomes so convenient to ride a motorcycle for you that it doesn't really matter what it costs in certain right. circumstances or maybe even availability i don't know how many r1300s there are uh and i think i don't think you can buy that's your test model or something yes. but anyways if there was only one in the entire state and somebody bought it here they'd probably feel like they got a good deal exactly yeah so i want to uh, go back really quick to what you said because it's interesting i interviewed um brandon tech at this past weekend and that episode is amazing we went for almost three hours uh but a lot of insight into into leadership and just you know in life in general and one of the things we talked about was uh, almost exactly what you stated. Uh, being a leader is, uh, you know, giving your folks the left and right limits, almost like the bumpers on uh, bowling alleys, but then saying, go make it happen. And if you don't make it happen, maybe you're not the guy. But I think, uh, who are the owners, actually, of uh, Foothills? Uh, a company called Big Iron Sports. Big Iron Sports. So Big Iron Sports, if they're allowing you to do that, if they're allowing you to say, hey, I'm going to tell you what to do, not how to do it. And obviously, you know, here are your parameters. And uh, I think that I know whether you're selling motorcycles or anything else, because uh, I've been in the corporate sector and I've been with companies that said, tell me you what to do and how to do it. It's not a great place to be. So I think that helps your culture, your environment, and probably helps you sell motorcycles. Definitely. I want to empower my staff to um, achieve their goals and achieve our goals and achieve our clients' goals all at the same time. And when we, you set up a, a mission statement, if you will, or a, our common goal, um, when I hire people, I make sure that they have that common goal and they're motorcycle enthusiasts. Um, once you have those people, you just set up those bumpers and let them run. I love that. And have, have you seen uh, folks really thrive in that environment? Yes, Absolutely. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. I wanted to address some of the, I don't say myths, and I, I want to dig deeper into parts and service, but we talked about financing. Is there a good time to buy or not buy? Because I think one of the myths, especially here when it gets you know pretty nasty in the winter, is that you guys are desperate to sell bikes in the winter. So I, if I walk in here in January, I'll probably score a better deal than if I walk in here in, say, June, the height of riding season. The best time to buy a motorcycle is when you're excited to buy one. Oh. Um, in, in the winter, it's definitely slower. I've got less people in here, so we can spend more time with each client uh, and make sure they get an awesome experience. I'm not saying we don't do that in the summer, but with a lot more people walking through the door in the summer, it's more uh, strenuous for us to give that experience to everybody. Mm. 
in the service department, um, we try and get as many people in, in the winter as we can so that they can spend the summer riding. Um, we'll get backed up three, four, five weeks sometimes in the service department, and that isn't good for anybody um, because people want to get out and ride. But when they're thinking about it, uh, because the weather's nice and they see other motorcycles on the road, that's when they go out and get their bike uh, out, of the, out of the garage and find out the battery's dead and it needs an oil change and the tire's flat. Um, we try and reach out to all of our service clients throughout the winter uh, and go pick up their bikes and make that happen so that they're ready to go. So um, there's definitely <coughs> up and down times in the motorcycle industry in Colorado, mm. uh, but we are here year round and we're thinking about motorcycles year round and we try and spread that to all of our clients as well. So what you're telling me is this is going to be this if I come anytime, but there is probably a better time to get your bike serviced. Uh, yes, there's definitely better times to get your bike serviced. Uh, that price is set by the manufacturer and I try and uphold that. Obviously I want to yeah. make my money so I can keep all of us employed here and yeah. feed my employees. Um, it's a, a greater disservice for me to go out of business and not be able to service our clientele, uh, than it is to charge MSRP year round. So we talked about, you know, what you're allowed to do, not do what, what is life like, like a general manager? So uh, I asked this question because I think folks want access to you. So if I come in and I want to buy this bike and then I talk to whoever the salesperson is and then I'm like, yeah, I'd like to talk to your manager. And then Brendan's sitting over there and we talk to him. It's like, yeah, I want to get to the guy. I want to get to you. I guess there's a two part question. What, what does a GM do? I mean, I'm sure you're going spreadsheets and margins and tracking people and all that stuff, but you know, people want the access to you, especially during the busy season. I want to sit down with you and tell you my personal story and make sure that I get the best deal I can walking out the door. I have to imagine that's the case. It is. And I enjoy talking to my clients as much as I can. Um, I, especially about motorcycles, where motorcycles have taken them, where do they want to go? What are their motorcycling goals? Uh, that's why I'm here. I'm a motorcycle enthusiast. Mm. Um, I, I started on a parts counter at 10 bucks an hour and have made it this far because I love what I do every day and I love being around this industry and talking to those people. Um, so I definitely enjoy when I get that experience. Um, as far as what does a general manager do, there's quite a long list. So um, I can't spend as much time as I would like to talking to all of our clients because I am here to uh, be the director, if you will, mm. um, of the whole store and make sure all of, all of my team are doing their jobs to, to give the client the best experience. Um, part of that is uh, my personality type is a, uh, a logistics type of person. Okay. I'm not necessarily uh, very social or great at conversation, um, but I am good at hiring people that are good at that. Um, so my staff is going to give my clients the best experience um, as far as that goes. But when I get to talk to people about motorcycling, I love it. Nice. So we talked about your clients. What is your, in your mind, uh, the person that walks through that door, the perfect client? And maybe it's not a money bags person, but who is the perfect client? The perfect client is somebody who is going to spend whatever money they have on motorcycles. I have people that have... $10 of disposable income and $100,000 of disposable income a month. And if those people are just passionate about two wheels and where it can take them and that experience of riding, uh, that's my perfect client. Mm. So you know I have to go to the other end of the spectrum. Worst client. The one that you're just like pulling your hair out, whatever it is. Mm. Consider your words carefully, sir. No, I'm just kidding. No, yeah, go for it. Uh, the, the worst client that walks through the door is somebody that doesn't want to be around motorcycles, but there are people that walk into dealerships that, um, that just try and argue with us and, and oppose our views and different points and, um, kind of shit on our products, if you will. Oh, this one's better. That one's better. The Honda's better. Um, the, they're not here for that goal. They're here as a, kind of a nuisance, I guess. Um, and surprisingly, those people are out there. Um, I guess that's my answer to that. Maybe come back to that. I'll have a better one. No, no, that's a great. I think as you just made me think about something like, so there are people that come in here. I mean, obviously I've come, I've gone to countless dealerships and just looked around like, Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Um, but there are people that come here specifically with the intention to, I don't know, cause drama or whatever it is, or say that 1300, it's 28 grand. looks just like a Suzuki. That's 15. You know what I mean? Like, what, why are you here? Is it? It seems like it happens more often than not. Yeah, and I, I guess a, a better answer to, to your last question would be somebody that comes in and treats this as a business. 
mm. uh, which is hard because this is a business. Um, but when you only look at it on paper, uh, and, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, the, I want you to get lost in the passion of this whole thing while you're in here and see all the cool stuff there is to see here. Mm -hmm. um, when it's all dollars and cents and Excel spreadsheets, it's not very fun. And we're not here for the logic side of, of our brains. Uh, there's nothing logical about a motorcycle and, you know, two wheels with no protection. You're exposed to the elements, yep. um, you know, traveling 80 miles an hour next to cars. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, if we were here for logic, I'd be selling minivans. <sighs> yeah. Trade-ins. Let's get to that. I have this sure. long list and I'm just trying to blast through because I have so many uh, questions for you. Um, and you're right to your point. I mean, it, it, there is nothing logical. I mean, I think there are certain areas of the world or, you know, there are people that, that, um, very much need a motorcycle and use it every day as a mm -hmm. form of transportation. And, but for a lot of us, it's like a luxury item. Uh, it's yeah. a, it's a fun toy to have. I mean, obviously I ride motorcycles, uh, for a living now, but it's, uh, it's definitely, I, I see what you're saying, where you're looking at it as a business versus like, this is a, a lifestyle. I feel like I'm advertising for you, but it is a lifestyle, right? Fellow moto enthusiasts and all that. So when we talk about that, we talk about trade-ins. And I see some used bikes you got back here. Um, we got an Africa Twin, a Ducati, a couple other things. Yeah, so I think uh, let's talk about the trade-in process. We talked about financing. We talked about, um, you know, trying not to get screwed during financing. When we talk about trade-ins, I have to imagine that when somebody brings a bike in for trade, uh, they might not be the happiest. And I say this because uh, we talked about this. It doesn't matter if it's your motorcycle, if it's your home, if it's your car, you have a connection with that and you feel like it's probably worth more than it is. Do you experience that? Definitely. And they, you mentioned a second ago that people uh, come in, what, what did you say? Di or uh, disappointed or, um, what did I say? Um, that people come in and, and you start kind of in a negative place right off the bat. Yes. With trade yeah. Yeah. Uh, part of that comes from, you're not in love with your motorcycle anymore. You're trying to trade it in. You're trying to get rid of it. You mm. want something else. You want the, a new cool thing, or you want to do a different type of riding. Um, that, I don't know where to go with that. That's exactly, actually pretty but. good. Like, Hey, if you're coming to give this thing to me, you don't want it anymore. <laughs> That's actually yeah. If you're trying to trade in your bike, you, you don't necessarily want it anymore. So, uh, you don't want to feel like you got screwed on that deal and you don't, you want to keep from getting screwed on your next bike. Um, so you're going to, try and get the most for your trade-in, which makes a lot of sense. We all want our stuff to be more valuable. Uh, and my job is to make it reasonable for me to get that motorcycle and then do all the stuff that I have to do to it and then uh, get it into the hands of its new owner and make sure they get a good deal as well and not overcharge them and make sure they get a good motorcycle. We have to get that bike through service, uh, change the oil on pretty much all of the bikes, make sure the tires are safe, go through uh, safety inspection, brakes. There's a lot of stuff I have to do to these motorcycles um, to unpersonalize them, if you will, uh, and get them ready for their next owner. So I, I have to think there's an aspect of um, convenience there. So I I know that if I have a, a so let's take my motorcycle, 2021 GS Adventure, I could sell it uh, on, you know, whatever it is, Craigslist, Cycle Trader, to a private party, and I could probably get more than after if I brought it here, but I would also have to deal with tire kickers, low ballers. Would you take it? Would you ship it? All the things. And I, uh, is that what that has to be what factors into some of your, your offers? It is. We talked about convenience earlier and a lot of the, the stuff my dealership does is to make motorcycling convenient for our clients. You can definitely get a couple more dollars on Facebook marketplace, trying mm -hmm. to sell your motorcycle there. Um, but it is challenging. You're going to have to, uh, deal with a lot of scammers and a lot of people and setting up times. There's there's a lot of hassle that goes with that uh, for a couple extra dollars. And when you come to a dealership to trade it in, it's definitely going to be a lower offer than you get on Facebook Marketplace because of what I just mentioned, How what we have to do to get that bike ready for its next owner. Um, but you can come in with your keys and a title or uh, your, your payoff. And within an hour, I'm going to have you on a new motorcycle. Right. And I think there is some disconnect there. And uh, I don't know, let's use $10,000. Retail for, um, for this motorcycle, it's worth 10000 bucks. retail. 
So if I bring it to you and I say, Ooh, we're going back to what would that show? Uh, Pawn Stars. Uh, and the if best I, say, I can do is twenty five hundred bucks. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, but if I come to you and I say I want ten grand for it, you're like, well, dude, I got to sell it for ten grand. That means I got to give you like I don't know sixty five hundred, whatever it is. And uh, there has to be some education there, right? Yeah, there's definitely some education uh, starting from what the bike is actually worth. Mm. Um, a lot of people that come in with their trade, they have an idea of what it's worth because they've looked up maybe similar bikes. Mm -hmm. um, but I have data from across the nation on bikes that are listed for sale and bikes that are actually sold in every different condition range for every different model. So um, I have really good data on that. So I, I, have an, I can make an educated guess on what that bike is actually worth. Uh, and then I have to back it up to uh, get it through service to do a service inspection. Uh, my technicians back there are all highly trained and, and paid fairly well to do their job. And uh, they have to be able to go through that motorcycle, figure out what it needs. And whether, you know, when you talk about tires, that can be five, 600 bucks right there. Yeah. So some of those can, can add up pretty quickly. And then I have to be able to uh, make a couple bucks on it as well. You talk about, um, uh, what were we talking about? Oh, comparables. And so I think this is another one. And I've dealt with this in the car industry. You look on Kelly Blue Book. My um, thing, you know, I put on all the parameters. It's worth $10,000, whatever. And then you go to the dealer and like, ah, we don't use that. We don't use that. Um, what is the best means by which um, for somebody to kind of estimate the value of their motorcycle before bringing it to you or just selling it outright, right? Because if you do go to did Kelly Blue Book, do motorcycles? Kelly Blue Book is one. Uh, JD Power, which was mm -hmm. formerly NADA Values, that's what the bank uses. Mm -hmm. So that's a good source. Um, I take both of those and uh, a couple other sources, uh, Cycle Trader and NPA, National Power Sport Auctions, and a, a couple different sources. So um, I group all of that together. Uh, as a consumer or a, uh, a seller on the retail market on Facebook Marketplace, um, JD Power and Cycle Trader are probably your two best avenues to find the value. Um, what you're going to find there, though, is the like on Cycle Trader or other bikes for sale in Craigslist or Marketplace, um, you're going to find what they're listed for and not necessarily what they're selling for. Mm, so now, you got to keep you that. Can you see in mind. data like uh, in the industry? Can you see data on what things sold for? Yes. Okay, so that really helps you, not like top line retail, but it really sold for this. Yep. Yeah, that's really good because I think uh, I actually sold an ATV recently and I. I looked up the price, and uh, I think it was like retail uh, for a use. It was used was like uh, eight thousand or eighty five hundred. I was like, okay, that's a good starting point. Then I went to like um, Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, ATV Trader, and I'm seeing these things sell for like sixty five hundred, seven grand. And I'm like, well, then it's not worth eighty five hundred. Or I couldn't. I mean, I could list it for that, but people can go anywhere else. So I think that that's good. You get the uh, you get the bottom line. What did this actually sell for? Do you ever get calls? I gotta think. Um, did anybody ever call you and say, hey, man, why'd you sell it for that? Like, because you're screwing me. It's almost like your, your neighbor down the street that low balls and sells your house and leaves. And you're like, you just brought the value of my house down. Is that something in the industry? Uh, maybe once or twice. But uh, our, our job when you're trading your bike in is to educate you on all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and my whole team knows to be as transparent as possible. So uh, that just leads to a good deal in the end. I want to make sure you understand why I'm offering you what I'm offering you and right. not just blindly saying, no, nah, it's worth half of what you think it is. Yeah. Um, I, there's very good reasons why it's worth what it's worth. And, uh, I want to try and show you all those reasons in detail on your motorcycle. Um, you've got three thirty seconds of tread wear left the oil, you know, I don't have any service records. Um, you know, a lot of different modifications on the bike. Mm. Um, like I said, we have to depersonalize them. Um, when people modify their motorcycles, that may not be what the next owner is going to like. Um, there's some weird modifications out there, more power to you. I love it. But yeah. uh, if that bike comes in here, it, it is going to lower the value because there's a lot of work that has to go into that motorcycle to make it sellable to the next person. So I want to make sure that the client knows all of these things uh, so they don't feel like I'm screwing them because that's not my intention. So we talked about best and worst customer. Uh, kind of along those same lines, in your mind, if you saw a bike roll through as a trade, what are you excited about? Like, man, I can totally turn that over. Or, or somebody brings in something else, you're like, this thing's going to sit forever. Uh, you know, from your perspective, what do you think? There's a, a couple bikes on a hot list, if you will, that I'm really excited to see them because they, you, they don't usually come in used. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of those bikes are either 
very valuable and fetch a lot of money in the secondary marketplace. So we, a dealership doesn't often see those. Uh, good quality dirt bikes would be an example. Or um, maybe S1000 double R's, used S1000 double R's. They're very high in demand. So I, when I get one of those in here, um, I am excited for the opportunity to have somebody that comes to buy that bike um, and get them into a dealership and see what we do. Um, because those people that often buy on the second hand market, uh, they are against dealerships and don't want to go into a dealership. So that's where they shop. So when I have a, a perfect example of a motorcycle that they want to buy secondhand, but they have to deal with a dealership, uh, that's my opportunity to show them what we can do and that we're not this dealership. Mm. And it's interesting. As, as you talk, I, other questions roll into my head and that's not on my notes here. And I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about saving this for Brendan, who's sitting over there, your sales manager. But I want to ask you, so we live in America. It's a, it's an amazing country. And, um, I think people have the right to choose. And I made a video once about, you know, helmets. I highly endorse helmets as somebody that's had some major wrecks and has seen the aftermath with people that don't wear. But in my mind, you should have that opportunity to choose, the freedom to choose, right? That's part of it. Freedom instead of being um, told you must or must not. And now the other argument is, well, we, we got laws and I don't want to go down that path. But when we talk about America and we talk about somebody that has never ridden motorcycles before, they have the freedom to come in this dealership and say, that double R with 205 horsepower, I want that. What, as a GM, are your thoughts on that? Because, you know, it almost becomes apparent kind of where I'm going with this. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, a phrase I heard a long time ago, and I, I live by in that scenario, is uh, we're not counselors, take their money. Mm. I, I am going to do what I can to show you that bike or show you... Uh, if you're set on a double R and you're a first time rider, maybe I'm going to show you the safety features that it's got ABS, it's got uh, different ride modes and show them how you can like put that thing in rain mode for the first couple hundred miles until you get used to it. Um, stuff like that. I'm not necessarily going to hold somebody back from a motorcycle. Uh, that happens a lot with new riders where people say, oh, no, you should start on a 250. I'm not going to sell you anything bigger because you got to start. You got to start small. Right. I don't believe in that necessarily. My first bike was a sport bike when I was 18 years old and mm -hmm. I'm still here. So uh, it's up to the the individual person. Um, but I say if you've got the money and you want to buy whatever you want, do it. Yeah. I, uh, my first bike uh, was a 98 or 99. It was a ZX6R. And within two weeks, I put it in a ditch. And it wasn't because it was super powerful. I just I didn't know how to ride a motorcycle. I came around a very slow corner and I target fixated and I just <laughs> right into the ditch. So maybe yeah, training is a good thing. Tr training is, is definitely a good thing. And I preach on that a lot more than me trying to steer you towards a lower CC motorcycle or something with less power. I'm going to tell you to go get training. Mm -hmm. uh, it is incredible how many bad riders are on the roads and people don't realize how bad of a rider they are until they take some of the advanced training classes. And uh, I could talk about training all day, but uh, for some of the guys that have ridden 20, 30 years, if you don't do anything to advance your, your skill set or take advanced training, then you have one year riding experience 20 or 30 times. Yes. I, and, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about that because I think there are people use years and people use miles. Um, so if I've been riding for 20 years, uh, but, you know, I get my bike out, you know, three, four times a year just to do a couple of things, then what is that? Or if I have ridden, hundred thousand miles but all of my rides have been on the highway or poker runs or whatever it is right then really what's the value of that so i think that there has to be a training aspect actually uh you guys was probably two three years ago and maybe four but uh, you allowed me to uh, participate in the uh, ride like a cop course and i consider myself a pretty proficient rider i mean i've done a ton of tra track days back in the day did some club racing uh take the gs out and I do a bunch of stuff so we go up there and they set up all these cones do fish out of water now, I don't know how much personally, uh, I, the one thing I took from that was friction zone and kind of doing switchbacks up and down the, the mountain roads, but I was just blown away. Uh, there were guys on Harleys just uh, obliterating me. And so I think there is a value to training, whether it might not be the training that you think you need. Like, oh, all I want to do is track days. Okay, great. Man, you go out and do these cone courses, you realize, man, I got some blind spots. And it might just be parking lot maneuvers or it might be U-turns or it might be the first time I rode up uh, Jones Pass, actually, it was a, maybe it was the second time, I'd done the ride like a cop course, and there were some very tight, steep switchbacks in the dirt. And uh, by implementing what I learned there, the friction zone part, where I was, which allowed me to do these tight cones, I was able to navigate those tight switchbacks. And I was just like, man, that, that's pretty damn cool. 
So I do think that the training, there is value in training. And I think ego gets in the way of us uh, doing that. I don't need that. I've been riding for 15 years, whatever it is. What, uh, what type of training do you guys either offer or push or work with folks to get folks training out of here when they buy a motorcycle? Uh, a couple of different avenues, and we're working to make those even better. Uh, but for one, just the basic rider course. A mm -hmm. lot of people come in the door and uh, don't have their motorcycle endorsement yet, and they want to see motorcycles and get into it, but they don't know where to start. Um, so first pointing them in the right direction there, um, whether it be one of our sister stores that has a riding course or uh, some other local options here. Um, promoting training from the very beginning uh, is important to me. Uh, after that, some advanced riding courses like Ride Like a Pro, uh, mm -hmm. or we did Ride Like a Cop, uh, which is all low speed parking lot maneuver um, type of stuff. But it also brings you right back to the fundamentals of the friction zone and counter steering. And some of that stuff you learn in the basic rider course, and then you get out on the road and you forget all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, that, that Ride Like a Pro course really teaches the mindset of riding. Um, and shows you what how a motorcycle is built um, and what it's built to do and how to use that. Um, that's a, a really exciting uh, opportunity for, for riding uh, or a different medium, if you will, of riding, uh, of more advanced training and learning some of that stuff and learning how to really do what you want your motorcycle to do. Uh, a lot of people that think they're really good riders, you can watch them do a U-turn in a parking lot and it'll tell you pretty quick how good <laughs> of a rider they actually are. Yeah, because, uh, man, that's that's back to ride like a cop. I um uh, you know, when you're, when you're doing a lot of higher speed turns or, or even just, you know, low speed twisties or whatever, that was the first course where we did a, I did a, for the first time, a lot of like full lock steering stuff. And it's very unnerving. And, you know, if you drop your bike, you're doing two miles an hour in a parking lot, but it's still, uh, for somebody like myself, I was like, I had to learn, like, this is not what I do. So yeah, it's interesting. Well, that type of training is cool because most of the laydowns, if you will, the most times a bike is, is falling on its side is very low speed in a parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, when you're you know, cruising through a parking lot at five miles an hour and a car starts to back out in front of you, it's very easy to grab the brakes full lock and dump the bike. Yep. Um, so when you get to train for that type of riding and train in that environment, um, you significantly reduce the risk of that motorcycle falling over. When I think back on recent uh, falls, it's all been that maybe you got your off, your footings off and the bike stalls, or maybe your stupid hill control on the BMW that you just figured out or you just bought, you don't understand it and it stalls you. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's that low speed stuff. I was actually standing in the parking lot a couple years ago and I saw somebody test riding the bike. They came in, turned around, dropped the bike. I mean, what does even, you know, they had just come to a stop and it was a little too heavy for them. So yeah, you're right. I think there is value in that. Is there, I was having a discussion with my riding buddy, Eric. I was like, what's the value in all these cone drills? Yeah, maybe you're not, when you're heading out west on a trip, you're not doing a lot of that, but maybe you are. Maybe you're loaded down in the hotel parking lot and you have to do some low-speed stuff. I don't know. I, I just think there is a bunch of value in all types of training and continuing education. The more you know about your motorcycle, it can only help you. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of mindset type of training uh, at speed as well. Um, so the parking lot stuff is all low-speed, but that's where it kind of sets the fundamentals for how you should be thinking um, behind the bars when you're on the road. Um, what I hate hearing is, oh, I used to ride street, but it's too dangerous, all the crazy people out there. Hopefully those people got on a dirt bike or got somewhere else uh, in the, you know, on two wheels and didn't just give up riding. But um, I find dirt bikes are actually more dangerous. I've crashed way more times on a dirt bike than I have on the street. Yeah, and then when you, uh, so my, my biggest crashes have been on the racetrack. I mean, like hospital ambulance rides. Fortunately, they have people there immediately to react. Um, but I, and back to the track thing, I think, you know, I, I've known a lot of folks, I'm only track now, no street. I'm like, man, I've done so many epic, uh, trips on my BMW. I mean, you're missing out. I mean, like just a long one week, two week trips where you're just kind of out there figuring stuff out spontaneous. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing, amazing, uh, whether you're on a, a GS adventure or you're on a freaking KLR 650, it doesn't matter. I think it's just exploring out on two wheels and you're hot and you're cold and you're hungry and you're tired and whatever. I think you're missing out if, you, if you're not, uh, if you're, if you're leaving that behind. Yeah. And some of that training can, can make it feel safer for you to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a statistic that I like, uh, from 2020, uh, the Colorado state patrol said in Colorado that it was over 90% of fatal motorcycle accidents were the fault of the rider, mm. which 
is scary to think about riders dying on motorcycles, but um, what we can take out of that is if you pay attention and you are riding within your means, 90% uh, chance you're gonna be just fine. I've ridden almost 75,000 miles on the street and I have never had an accident on the street. Yeah. Uh, and it's just that training and mindset and um, knowing what cars are gonna do before they do it. Um, and part of that comes with a lot of miles. You mentioned earlier, um, <coughs> Uh, X amount of miles make mm -hmm. you a better rider or X amount of years make you a better rider. It's a combination of all of that, but it's also a combination of different types of riding, yes. um, whether it be the low speed parking lot stuff or different types of motorcycles. Uh, but riding on dirt and riding adventure is probably the best thing in my mind to make you a better rider. When you get to play with no traction and sliding that motorcycle around, that's going to make you a better, safer rider on the street. I agree. I think, and that was a big challenge for me moving to Colorado. Oh man, that was about eight years ago, but I came out with a KLR 650 and I had a Ducati, uh, 1098S and, uh, I never wrote it. I sold it, uh, cause I live off on dirt roads. And I was like, what am I going to do with this thing? So the beauty of this state and the surrounding states is you can, yeah, you're out on the road and you hit this dirt and then you're on a mountain pass and then you're doing this thing. And, uh, my riding has vastly improved being able to hit that different sort of terrain versus just street only. And it really opens your your eyes to and changes the way you think about uh, the state and the environment mm. um, when you're an adventure rider. I have ridden a lot of miles on pavement all around Colorado. I've ridden almost every highway around the state. And I kind of build that map in my head about how do I want to get somewhere? What highways am I going to take? And you start to know um, those avenues around the state. But when you can get on an adventure bike and um, ride to Leadville, for example, and then go up over Hagerman Pass, and suddenly you're in uh, basalt and near Aspen in a whole different spot, um, and you get to see some incredible landscape, you get a, a crazy challenge of taking one of these fully loaded bikes up over a mountain pass with rocks at you yeah. know, 12 something thousand feet. Uh, but then it puts you into a spot uh, that you had to ride maybe hours around to get there before on the street. Uh, and it kind of changes that map in your head of, of where you can be uh, and what you can see. I'm glad that you go out there because I've, you know, obviously before I got into the whole podcasting thing, I was doing a bunch of mapping stuff and I've all over Colorado paved dirt roads. And I would come to events, uh, some hosted by you guys, and I would talk and it's, it would, it would seem like most guys or girls, you know, most people that ride motorcycles don't get west of like Idaho Springs. And, you know, they know like peak to peak highway. And, you know, for, for anybody watching, listen, that's just very, these are roads all very close to Denver. And I'm like, what? Well, you live in Colorado, bro. Like, what are you doing? All the good shit is out There's west. a lot of cool stuff to see. Yeah, a lot of cool stuff to see. And you're up here messing around within 20 minutes of the city. But I found that dynamic interesting. Um, but, you know, riding these roads near the city, that's where you see all the sport bikes. Uh, then you yeah. go out west. And I was like, man, if I, there's some uh, slum gully and pass and all this stuff way out west. I was like, if I had a sport bike on this, I would be in trouble because I would be absolutely just breaking the law. Ghost rider, right? Like, uh, so it's some really good roads out west. I, I want to, um, I think we've been going about an hour and some change here, but I want to, I want to ask you, I want to finish up with a, a question. I want to get into service a little bit. I think there's some misconception there. I actually made a couple of videos uh, a couple of years back and I, I I was here and I think once was just a basic service and another was like a valve check and I had like the paperwork with me and I was like, oh, it cost this much, you know, being very transparent and, and man, you would believe comments like, oh, rip off and all this stuff. Um, first question is why does an oil change at the time? Uh, $311, $311 for, well, was, I think it was an oil change. I, I think it was all I did. Why does the oil change cost three hundred and eleven dollars? Uh, a couple of reasons. One, it the time it takes to do an oil change it might mm -hmm. be thirty minutes, mm -hmm. uh, but when you have a motorcycle in the parking lot and a service advisor has to go out and check it in, uh, double check the bike, get the VIN, um, get all of your information, hopefully chat with you a little bit and figure out what um, why you ride and what your goals are for your motorcycle and then get that paperwork back to a service technician. And then a, yet another person has to grab that motorcycle, pull it in, get it onto a lift, um, strap it down safely, um, get that lift up into the air, get the parts. Now I've got a, a parts team that's grabbing um, every, every necessary item for that, bringing it back to the service technician. Um, you know, the time that you 
get the drums of oil in and set up and you know a lot of stuff goes into actually making that 30 minute oil change happen and the technicians being paid on time mm. um, that is is kind of where that comes from um, you can be assured that your service is going to be done right and i'm going to also do a couple other items in there all your crush rings are going to be changed your uh, drain plug is going to be torqued using a torque wrench not the hopefully that's tight enough um, <laughs> i've so been there there's a lot of factors that go in, into that uh, including uh, you know high grade full synthetic motorcycle specific oil um, yeah there's there's a lot of factors but that's kind of a, an overview of of why an oil change can cost 300 bucks. And I'm using rough numbers because I actually did my own oil change for the first time. Uh, I'm a little ashamed just because I was like, okay, it was winter and I, I bought the oil and filter and that was almost like a hundred bucks. So your, you know, your margin of a couple hundred is, is your staff and your tools and your technicians, which by the way, the other question is what, uh, what type of training do your technicians go through to be able to, to wrench on these bikes, BMWs, Triumphs and all that? Uh, lots of manufacturer training. I fly my techs out um, usually at least once a year for update training on different mm -hmm. models. Um, and then there's uh, schooling that usually comes from the manufacturers uh, in between there. Uh, a lot of technicians come from other industries, so they've been trained in different uh, aspects, whether it be automotive or HVAC or you know any type of different trade um, that come into this industry. So they've got some prerequisite knowledge about, uh, mechanical things. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we train them on all the specifics. Um, a lot of technicians jump in through MMI, the motorcycle mechanics, Me mechanics Institute. Institute. Yep. Yep. Um, and that is kind of your, your college, if you will, for starting on motorcycle mechanics. Okay. Cause I think that factors in as well. Cause there are, I mean, proliferation of YouTube. I mean, I could figure out how to do, I won't say figure out, I could watch a video on how to just about do everything to my bike. And these are guys probably, I assume, uh, that are like very well versed. So I watched a video on how to change a drive shaft. I watched a video on how to adjust the valves. And me personally, I'm like, I will never, I don't say I will never do that, but it's, I don't want to do that. It just seems oil change. I'm okay with that. Even though at the end, I'm like, it takes this many, it's still not in a sight glass. I'm like picking the bike up, moving it around. But uh, yeah, there are some complex things that I'm just not comfortable with, especially with a very expensive motorcycle. And I, I would feel like that's probably also a little bit of your of your pitch. Like, yeah, you're paying a premium here. And I'm not speaking for you, but you're getting people that know how to work on this stuff. Yeah, part of it is the convenience of walking in, dropping off the keys, and uh, a couple minutes later, your bike's going to have fresh oil in it. Meanwhile, you can be enjoying some coffee or shopping for different apparel or talking to other motorcycle people. Um, or just coming back for your motorcycle later. Um, so part of it is a convenience factor. Um, the other part is it's a, even a simple oil change is actually very, very complicated. Mm. Uh, and getting it right the first time um, so you're not leaking oil or blowing up your engine, you know, there's a, there's a lot on the line even with an oil change. Um, so the, the, the torques, the, you know, the, if you accidentally thread your drain plug in wrong, um, many thousands of dollars to replace the case. Mm -hmm. um, or you're uh, time starting it, which is kind of not the right way to do it anyway. Um, so there's there a lot of risk, even in a simple oil change, um, and even calculating the oil level correctly. There's a specific way to check the oil on a lot of different bikes, and my technicians have the experience. They've dealt with this a lot, so they know all that stuff right off the top of their head and how to do it right. Yeah, I think the uh, – I actually have a torque wrench, by the way, but the uh, for many years it was like, ah, it feels pretty good. And I think most cases you'll be okay, but if you're not okay, then you're really not okay. Yeah. And then bigger problems happen, man. Well, I'll just end with this and I'll let you kind of discuss it or, or how you want to articulate it, I think is a great uh, idea. Cause you know, I, I really want to thank you for coming on the show and dude, I cannot wait to publish some of this. I mean, some of the stuff that I'm going to take and put in short real clips is going to like make the internet explode. But I think it's important to be very transparent and very authentic and very like a little bit vulnerable and let me ask you some questions. And um, we didn't like rehearse any of the answers or anything like that. So Foothills BMW, uh, why is this dealership uh, special? Why is this dealership better than other BMW dealerships? Why is this dealership? And, and I don't know those guys. I'm sure they're good guys and girls. I always got to say that. Make sure I say that. Uh, better than BMW of Denver. Right. You got to believe you're the best. Right. Why is that? My 
answer to that is how do I want to word that? Okay, well, while you're thinking about that, uh, in corporate America, I'm going to give you some insight. Uh, you're on a team, right? I'm a, I'm a director of this. I have uh, peers that are directors of their respective teams. We're a team. I still want to beat the shit out of those guys, right? So I feel like, and I, I just want to make it a little easier for you, uh, however your answer might be. But, yeah, you might work with those folks, but you st still probably want to kick them down the road, I would assume. Yeah, um, I, I guess here's my, my answer to that. What, um, when I started, when I got my first job at 17, um, I had nothing but bad managers, and mm. I've seen bad businesses. Um, my first couple jobs were all poorly run, um, very poorly, and I got to really learn how not to do things. Um, mm. So I kind of accidentally ended up um, with this company at 10 bucks an hour on a parts counter, and I uh, got to grow up through this industry and see a lot of different ways different managers do things. And I always thought, man, if I was the GM or I got to control this, here's how I would do this. Or, uh, you know, I would, I would come at it from a client's perspective or um, how do I make this better? What's the best way to do this? Mm. And um, being passionate about motorcycles and, and uh, it, in a good company, I've been able to get to a position where I'm now able to control all of that. Um, so I can not make the same mistakes I've seen a lot of my past management make or past companies I've worked for. And I get to actually control all of that from the time the client walks through the door uh, to the time that they're back buying their fourth motorcycle from us. Um, it's very cool to have the power to be the best dealership. And um, when I say I'm going to change something, make it better, we're going to do it. Have you ever thought about politics? That's a good answer. <laughs> That's a good non-answer answer. answer. <laughs> That's uh, good. No, I get it, man. I get where you're coming I from. I have thought about politics. Yeah. I don't no, think that was I need very, to get there. That was very good. And for not uh, having been on a podcast or anything, very, very, very good. I, I appreciate the answers. I can't wait to publish it. So, um, yeah, I'll let you have the last word. Since you've never been on a podcast, and who knows how long until we have you on again, let you have the last word. Uh, I've watched a lot of podcasts. It was fun to be part of this. Uh, I think you are an incredible host, and the way you've set this up and structured this uh, is it makes me feel very comfortable to um, pull back the curtain on the dealership, if you will, um, and, and, <laughs> and kind of talk about why we're different and what why we come to work every day um, mm -hmm. and give you an honest answer to that. So I appreciate that from you. We're going to have to get T-shirts made. I mean, just embrace it. Lean into it. The dealership. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. That's cool. All right. Well, Chance, thank you so much for being on. I'll shake your hand here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you next time.